grit, gallantry, guts, glory. These qualities that were so pertinent in our battles hundreds of years ago are relegated to the pages of history. But with the popular game Empire Total War, we're going to bring these stories to life. By analyzing strategy and statistics through this virtual medium, we can gain our understanding of these stories that grace our history books. This series is going to relive the battles that turn the tide of great wars and change the way we interact with military history forever. I'm Sam Hutchison, and this is Taylor's Tales. Hello, my name is Sam Hutchison, and welcome to the very first episode of Taylor's Tales. Now, I'm very excited to start this series. Um, in the link in the description uh, will be a link to the Zachary Taylor Project. Uh, they are the ones supporting this channel, and um, they're trying to do the amazing goal of bringing history to life. So what they're doing is, is amazing. Please go check them out after this video. Um, but besides that, let's get into it. So I decided for the first episode of Taylor's Tales, we talk and look at 19th century warfare because how they fought back then is completely different to how we fight today. Uh, I'm talking they're fighting in lines, they're using different types of shot to when they're firing their cannons, and the types of tactics just look really weird from a, a viewer's point of view, uh, different from how a history buff might see it. So we're gonna be talking, looking at the armies back then, what they were made up of, the type of uh, formations and the different types of rounds and what they did um, as well. Because all this stuff will be a huge role to how Zachary Taylor, who the series is going to be about, how he fights, how, how his tactics are worked, and himself as a general, his qualities. Um, and so that's what we're going to be looking at. To begin off, uh, we're going to be talking about infantry. Um, infantry is the main bulk of an army back then. Um, they would be the ones, you know, closely fighting, firing back and forth at each other. And uh, no, they wouldn't be just standing in fields, letting themselves get shot, because that was obviously <laughs> crazy. They fought in lines for a couple of reasons. Um, first reason is communication. I mean, when you're fighting on a field, um, having yourself be split up from the rest of the army, having each soldier be its own person, then as a regiment, gets very confusing for the general taking a look back and trying to move his troops around. So how they did this is by sending out riders to, to send messages to these regiments and moving them across the battlefield was very important. So these regiments, having them be told where to move is what gained them the advantage over the field. Um, commanders were able to move them to the certain points that they needed them to be. So having them in line was very important for communication. But not only that, it was also very important for how their weapons worked. They're not using automatic rifles, machine guns, and stuff. They're using muskets. Um, and muskets are very inaccurate at this point. By having them fight in these lines and shooting volleys, essentially firing all at the same time, uh, back and forth could do a lot of damage to the enemy. So having that as well was very important. And lastly, cavalry was a big factor on the battlefield. And having infantry stand in these lines, this formation would allow them to repulse cavalry back. And that was very important. Um, you know, before the bayonet, which is essentially just a, like a knife that you would attach to the end of your barrel of your musket. Um, you know, if you had them pointing out all simultaneously, the cavalry, the horseman and the horse um, would not want to charge into that because it was basically uh, riding right into a wall of spears. Um, and no one wants to do that, especially the horse. So, you know, having them be able to repulse cavalry, communicate easier, and the better use of their firearms is why they fought in these lines. And it wasn't just because of why not, it was, you know, for real reasons. These, these journals that came up with these ideas actually used, uh, played a major part in fighting uh, during the 19th century. But it wasn't just every infantry was a soldier that fought a line. We had soldiers who did fight in a loose formation. Um, you could call them skirmishers, you can say light infantry. They would do things like harassing the enemy 
so they could kind of draw them in to where they wanted so they could get, you know, a better angle on them and, and cause more casualties to, to their regiments. So uh, loose formation, you know, each soldier's kind of individual, so having them charged by cavalry was very deadly, but having them that hit and run tactics was very important for these types of soldiers. They used better quality uh, muskets. They were rifled, which basically means that there was grooves inside the barrel to, to spin the ball as it was coming out, and that would make it more accurate and deadlier. So that's the type of to, the type of uh, firearms that they used, and they could hit at longer ranges. Going back on before, we talked about cavalry, which is what we're going to be talking about next, because cavalry uh, would fight in a different way. Uh, they were there to kind of get the surprise and the better angle, and to outmaneuver them on the field. Um, I mean, charging them from the side or from behind could completely break a regiment of soldiers. And, and cause heavy, heavy casualties to those regiments. So by having them charge from behind or from the side could do a lot of damage. Now, cavalry can be, can't really be split up. Um, I mean, it kind of depended on what weapons they had with them. You know, some cavalry regiments had, you know, uh, lances or swords, and a lance was just kind of like a spear or a pike, if you want to call it that as well. But a lance and a, a sword were very common for these type of cavalrymen or horsemen. Some also carried pistols and, and shortened rifles called carbines, um, which, you know, taking a little bit off the, the end of the barrel to make it more compact for the horsemen firing. Um, so not too much for the, the equipment and the tactics for the horsemen uh, and cavalry in general because they were simply there to surprise them, also to harass them like life infantry, um, and hitting them from the side and, and behind is very important. Now, as most generals, they adapted to this. Uh, by this point, the uh, regiments then would do, uh, for infantry, would do a type of formation called square formation, which sounds stupid when you first hear it, but it makes a lot of sense when we get a little bit into a better detail about it. So obviously, these infantry would stand in a square, um, all facing outward, with their bayonets uh, attached. And this would kind of cause the horse to not charge right into the regiment. Because obviously these are animals and they're not gonna suicide run right into them. So they would kind of gallop around these these squares, allowing the, the soldier in the square formation to fire off their musket, hitting either the horse or the horseman right off. And uh, doing a lot of damage to cavalry. But that doesn't mean that by then they were useless. Having them to surprise infantry and to, to ambush them and coming from, from different angles really, really could route an entire regiment and causing many deaths and, and casualties to, to troops. When they had to harass, they had to be at a closer range. So this kind of goes into what we're talking about next, which is cannonry and artillery and, and, and the an amazing range of these cannons by this point was insane. Uh, they would fire cannonballs, obviously. How each artillery was different was the type of round that they fired. And basically by the weight of the, the cannonball is what that gun would be uh, classified as. You have guns like six pound artillery or eight pound artillery or 18 pound artillery. And that's kind of the differences for artillery but when we talk about the different rounds they fired, it played a huge role um, in battles, especially the battles we were going to be covering, like the Mexican-American War. So a different type of round that they fired uh, was grape shot or canister shot. The grape shot and canister shot is both like a shotgun shell. You know, they, they fire, they explode, they shoot these pellets uh, all over the place and could cause shrapnel shots and, and really destroy these regiments of soldiers or, or cavalry coming towards them. So... Uh, both worked very similar. Um, the difference is that grape shot had a bigger round put into the uh, cylinder that they were put in. Um, canister shot just used smaller rounds, like musket rounds. They compacted that full of musket rounds, and when it fired, it would be more used for infantry and could do a lot of damage. Uh, but grape shot as well, uh, doing causing heavy casualties to whoever it was pointed at. Lastly, the last thing I really want to talk about is terrain and weather. Terrain plays a huge part into wars now and all the way then, and it's played a huge part in history in general. Terrain 
has been how generals have gained advantages on the field and sometimes how they win battles. Um, having the high ground in any sort of battle setting is, is crucial to winning a victory. Uh, as soldiers at these times were able to point their muskets downward to whatever uh, regiment of troop was coming up, they would cause heavy casualties as firing downward is more accurate than firing upward. So by having these troops having to march up only to get shot up and ripped apart by either cannons or muskets uh, would easily rout these regiments or the enemy and, and have those troops on top of the hill win the war or the battle. It wasn't just infantry, it was also cannons, like I said. They could use it for longer ranges and get a better angle on the enemy. Um, and besides terrain, there was also weather. Weather would play a huge part, definitely during this time uh, period. They were using gunpowder to load their, their flintlocks and, uh, you know, to load cannons. So having the, the gunpowder be dampened by rain wouldn't allow it to make that explosion needed to fire off that projectile make it you know what made these weapons so deadly causing misfires or you know low low sparks to just like completely just fire like this these small explosions that wouldn't even sometimes leave the barrel of the gun fighting in the rain wasn't uh particularly the greatest but um you know drier type of uh, climate was better for the fighting of this time period rain could also cause things like you know more like muddier terrain which you know kind of goes into between both of them of terrain and weather having muddy terrain was very very bad for the general because he has to move his men he has to move his artillery he has to move these large large guns across the battlefield and having mud can really uh ruin the movement of these troops need to be placed quickly in order to to fight so having muddy terrain was pretty bad as well um and besides that uh that was basically it for the 19th uh, century zachary taylor major general zachary taylor is going to have to face these obstacles during his military career he's going to have to face bigger armies he's going to have to face poor terrain and yet Throughout his military career, he comes out victorious. Maybe he wasn't the one that was so tactical when fighting, but his uh, way of treatment towards his soldiers is what made him such a great general during uh, this, these times of conflict. So uh, Zachary Taylor is, is a, a very interesting person to look into as he is completely missed by history. Um, so I can't wait to talk about the battles that he's faced throughout his uh, lifetime. Besides that, um, I'm Sam Hutchison. This has been episode one of Taylor's Tales. Uh, please like and subscribe to the channel. Um, and of course, again, uh, please check out the Zachary Taylor Project. They're supporting this channel. They're doing such an amazing job trying to bring history to life. And uh, they're doing a lot of awesome things right now for our 12th president. So uh, again, uh, see you next time. We'll be talking about Palo Alto. A very important battle as it's the first major battle of the Mexican-American War uh, and a battle that's really going to test Taylor. So I can't wait to get into that to you uh, next episode.